Thank you. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, we have an amazing panel today. Today, we're going to go ahead and present our letters panel. I'm going to go ahead and introduce everybody. To my right here, I have Richard. Richard is up, maybe better. And I want to first thank Richard for everything you do for our affiliate community and for serving our great country. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Richard's been a loan officer for over 30 years. He's worked his way up from loan officer to sales manager to currently branch manager. And has been a branch manager for 14 years and really enjoys assisting buyers obtain the dream of owning their own home. Also, thank you, Richard. I would like to go ahead and introduce Margaret. Margaret came to the United States in 1988 from Taiwan, has been involved with property management since 1996. She's received her real estate salesperson license in April 2007, and she's passed the California real estate broker exam in April 2011. It's been in mortgage ever since 2011. Thank you, Margaret. I also have Mario Mazzanella. Mario is a reverse mortgage specialist committed to helping individuals achieve financial independence utilizing the reverse mortgage. He's attended UCLA, has a Bachelor of Arts in Economics from Cal State LA, loves to train with the Kobotan with the karate master Takayuki Komoda, and teaches the Kobotan as an extraordinary self-defense tool. Thank you, Mario. And I have Christopher Hahn, grew up in Monterey Park, and graduated from USC, Bachelor of Science in Business Administration. Started in the mortgage industry in 1990 as a mortgage originator. And Chris quickly moved to sales manager and is currently branch manager for GEM, where he's served for the last 16 years as branch manager. His specialty has always been working with the first time home buyer. So let's give a hand to our... I have some questions I wanted to ask. Let me go ahead and start with Richard. Richard, do all borrowers get the same interest rate on loans? That is one question. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Is it on? Okay. Yes. That's one question that gets asked a lot by me when I am qualifying a client. And the answer is very simply no. Not all buyers get the same rate. The rate that they are receiving is determined by their credit score, the loan value, the loan amount, and what is called risk-based pricing. So every different buyer or client is always gonna get a different rate. Uh, I constantly hear where, oh, well, my cousin got this rate six months ago. It doesn't matter, that was six months ago. Nobody is exactly the same. Everybody is different. Your FICO scores are different. The purchase price you're buying is different. The amount of down payment you're putting is different. And as we all know, interest rates can change every day. So you're never ever gonna get the same rate from one buyer to the next. Thank you, Richard. <coughs> Margaret, what, what is an agency loan, jumbo QL loan, and a non-QL jumbo loan? Okay. Um, agency loan, agency loan is means the loan is uh, fully documented and is, um, is backed by the government agency, uh, which is like a, a Fannie Mae, Freddie Mae, or Guinea Mae. The, uh, they are insure the agency to uh, the loan, which means that after the loan, it will be able to sold back to the agency they are sponsored. Um, and what's um, uh, QM and non-QM, the QM means uh, the qualified mortgage. Non-QM is not qualified mortgage, which is means very simple way. Uh, one is full doc. It has uh, all the document is uh, able to trace everything. Uh, Non-QM uh, is um, the loan is, is not fully documented. And for the loan officer term is uh, light dark or alternative dark, or we say no dark, which is you, there's uh, information is uh, uh, borrowers say whatever the money they have, whatever the uh, expense they have. And my personal, um, 
I do not do no doc because it's a high risk for the loan officer. And I don't know others because it's like information is make up. Um, I only do full doc and light doc. Um, light doc is still tracing the information. And the difference is the non-QM and QM. The QM is uh, DTI, the debt to income ratios is uh, under 43%. When it's a non-QM, it can be up to 50%, which is a higher risk of the loan. And the, in the other word, the interest rate will be also higher. Thank you, Margaret. Mario, what are the three main reasons for a reverse mortgage? Uh, well, great question. I get this all the time because there's a lot of confusions out there, but when you look around the experience right here over 70 years, that's a reverse mortgage in itself. So let's start right there. Uh, reverse mortgage is really a retirement tool. Just keep that in mind, retirement tool. So here are the reasons why I, the, what I, how, how I have helped a lot of these clients. One, they, by saving on the mortgage payment, they are using those funds now to fund their retirement. Very smart, from 700 to $3,000, multiply that times 12, you start doing the math and you start seeing if that makes sense, especially when they have a long term. Second, uh, they delay social security to get the, the best of the benefit from social security. That, I have seen that as a strategy they have been using someone to retire early, right? Third, they fund their long-term care insurance uh, in case that they get ill in the future. So they are, and, and also they preserve their portfolio. So if they have a 401k with a million dollars, they're not spending it on other things. This is some of the few reasons what I have seen that people are using rever reverse mortgages. So it is a retirement tool. So that's the main reasons for that. Thank you, Mario. Uh, Christopher, yes. what are interest rates expected to do in 2020? I don't have a clue. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Um, so, nobody truly knows what rates are going to do at any given time, but we still have to look at what things are going on in the economy, what the Fed is doing, uh, what world events are happening, and all those things will drive rates. So, this year is expected to be, luckily, a stable year for rates. 2018, we had four rate hikes. 2019, we had four, three rate reductions. This year, everyone is saying, hey, the economy is doing well. Inflation is in check. The, the government likes to see the inflation rate be at 2% or less, or somewhere floating around that range. And the economy is doing well now without inflation hitting, so those are all good things to keep rates stable. Now, that's not to say they're going to um, stay the same all year. You're going to see fluctuations, but they're expecting the average rate to probably be about 3.7 for conforming stuff. Jumbo stuff will be a little bit higher, or sometimes even lower with jumbo. But um, that's what the range is expected to be. Uh, they don't think there's going to be any Fed rate hikes this year. And again, they don't directly affect mortgage rates anyway, and Richard will talk more about that in a little bit. But look for a stable year with relatively low rates. So I think it's going to be a super good year for us to get a lot of buyers in the property at affordable, comfortable rates. And we're going to do great this year, everybody. Thank you, Christopher. Richard, can a person buy an investment property without providing income documentation? Uh, yeah. This is a program that has been coming around now. And uh, most lenders do have this. And it's called the Debt Service Coverage Loan where if you are buying an investment property, we're not gonna verify the income of the buyer. We're just gonna look at the property itself and verify that the rental income coming in on the property equals to or at least covers 1.25% of the mortgage payment. So if we have a 1.1 coverage, we're good. 1.2 is better. So all we're gonna verify is assets and that's a great investment opportunity for people that wanna buy investment properties but don't wanna show their taxes. Thank you, Richard. Margaret, what are the debt to income ratios for conforming and non conforming loans? Um, earlier, I mentioned the uh, conforming and non conforming loan. The ratio is uh, 
for conforming is 43%, and for non-conforming is can up to 50%. Okay, um, the, this is a talking about um, the, in general for the residential mortgage, for the uh, investment property is uh, we consider with the, uh, the uh, income from the investment property. Thank you. Mario, what are the common misconceptions about reverse mortgages? Well, great question. The first one that I usually get, the bank owns the, my home. Never. It's just another loan. The difference between a, a regular loan and a reverse mortgage is how you pay it. One, the one, the mortgage, I understood mortgage pay, uh, pay until you die. The other one, you die and you pay. That's the main difference. <laughs> so it's a loan, but it, it's just the difference on how you pay it. So that's number one. So the bank does not own your home. So what happens with the equity? Where does it go? To the people just like a regular loan. It goes to your family. Or if you have a living trust, it goes to that. There is no, you hear that. Okay, so that's the number one. The other one is, oh, uh, consider a, a reverse mortgage as a last resort. No, it's a retirement tool. Some people are actually using it to retire. Now, some of the clients, the seniors, why it became so passionate about reverse mortgages is because the seniors themselves have taught me lessons that I thought, oh my gosh, they're better than a loan officer than myself because they're getting wise. They're using that as a retirement tool. Instead of paying it until they die, they want to put back the gold into the golden years and they want to enjoy life. Really, that's what it comes down to about this thing. So I'm saying, wow, these guys are teaching me a heck of a lesson. So that's, don't wait until this becomes, a, it's just like trying to get a loan when you're like this, choking, then it becomes harder to get. Uh, the other one is, well, uh, you have to be debt free. That's not true, or your home has to be paid off. No, they pay off all of your mortgages. This is one of the main things that they do. 83 year old person with a, even on a $1,600 a month mortgage payment in Long Beach, working as a taxi driver to make to uh, to uh, pay his mortgage because Social Security doesn't cover. This guy was in tears when he signed docs. He couldn't believe it. He goes, "You mean I don't have to work anymore?" He says, "No." So he put back the. You're turning. Uh, you're making your home an asset. That's basically what I reverse. So those are some of the misconceptions: being debt-free, uh, uh, the bank is going to own your home. Uh, all of these little misconceptions uh, are out there. This is what you hear, uh, which are not true. Thank you, Mario. And uh, Christopher, what are zero down payment loans still available? 100% financing. Yeah, so the, there are actually two different things. Zero down, meaning you don't have to put any money down for this program. There's really only two that are kind of widespread, which are the VA loan, which of course is a great program out there to serve our veterans, but you have to have been a veteran or uh, married to a veteran or another veteran to purchase. You can also do a VA loan with somebody else, but they're gonna have to put a down payment when you're doing that. Um, USDA, U.S. Department of Agriculture, has a loan as well that's zero down. You don't have to put a down payment on it. It's more known in agriculture, or a little bit rural areas, but it can be used elsewhere. Um, but they're also zero down with a combination of secondary financing. So you might have a like an FHA loan that's normally three and a half percent down, or a conventional where you have to put a minimum of three to five percent down. Yet there are first-time buyer programs that will fund that three and a half or three or five percent down. So it's essentially giving them 100% financing. And on top of that, there's also additional secondary liens that can cover some of the closing costs. And sometimes they give these in the form of gifts even. So depending on the program, um, there is 100% financing still available. Usually you have to be a first-time buyer. Usually there's gonna be some kind of income restriction, maybe an area restriction. It's not gonna fit everybody, but they're still out there. I do a ton of them. And uh, they help people that you would never think could have gotten in. And those people will tell everyone and their brother that you help them when you get a zero down transaction because they didn't think they could do it otherwise. And a lot of people think, well, isn't that high risk? Are we gonna be losing these properties back to foreclosure? Luckily, in my experience, my clients haven't had that experience, but 
they are a little higher risk, so you do have to make sure that the clients who are getting into them are well aware of all the aspects of payment and budgeting and everything else. But debt ratios are typically a little bit tighter. Um, the underwriting scrutiny is a little more stringent on those, so it's not as high a risk as people think. And they're great, great loans to help people that maybe couldn't have done it otherwise. Have good jobs, good credit, but just can't save money because it's so expensive to live in California. So they are out there, both 100% loans with zero down, and then combo loans that will get you to that as well. Thank you, Christopher. Yeah. And I'm going to have one question remaining each for each uh, panelist, and then we're going to open it up for some Q and A. Okay. So that, that's Richard. How does the Fed rate affect mortgage rates? Well, this is kind of bu uh, buffering on what Chris had said. If we as a panel or we as all these experienced people knew what interest rates were going to do every day, God, I wouldn't be here. I'd be a billionaire. I'd be traveling the world. Um, we, can only, <laughs> we can only anticipate. But the, the biggest misunderstanding is that the Fed rate affect, affects mortgage rates. Yes and no. The Fed rate does not really set mortgage rates. Uh, instead, it determines the federal fund rate which impacts short-term interest rates, and that's the rate that banks borrow money from one and each other overnight. So that's, that's their fund, that's what they control. Uh, the mortgage rates are controlled by the bond market. So depending what the bond market and how it reacts to what the Fed is doing, that is gonna either negatively or positively affect mortgage rates. So everybody that, you know, I had a client, hey, the Fed cut the rate by a quarter, I want my rate to reduce. I, I wish I could, but that's not what happens. It's whatever the bond market is going to do in reaction to the Fed. So when you have buyers or you have somebody that's out there and they want to talk about rates and come to me, and first and foremost, it doesn't matter what the rate is. It's whether or not they can qualify and afford the payment. When I started loans, and I'm sure Chris and, and Mario and all of us, when we started loans 30 years ago, rates were 12, 14, 15%. And you had two basic rates. You had FHA and conventional. That's it. So it's either they qualify or they don't qualify. The rate really is not an issue. It's the payment, and it can they afford it. Thank you, Richard. Margaret, what is the minimum FICO score for loans today? Um, well, the non-QM is uh, minimum requirement is 620. And for the uh, QM is minimum is 680. Of course, the beta FICO scores, uh, they get a beta rate. Thank you, Margaret. Mario, can a reverse mortgage be used to purchase a home? Absolutely. Uh, some people are right-sizing. I don't like the, the term downsizing. That sounds right. Right-sizing from a five-bedroom, $3 million home. They can purchase and keep their uh, I would say about 40%, usually for a reverse mortgage, it's about a 40% to 50% equity. The older you are, the more you get. So you have to be 62 plus. So the older, if you're 70, you, you're going to get more somebody that there is 62 years old, right? So that's what we hedge. In there. But, uh, the, so the answer is really yes, but I, I would like to add a couple of things why this is becoming to be a situation where it's, you're going to see a lot more need. Uh, 11,000 uh, people are turning 62 years old per day for the next 16, 16 years. 30% uh, of baby boomers have no retirement. You're going to start hearing that, and I'm sure you already heard of some people that are looking into long-term care, and they're going into their suffering, okay? And the additional 25% has less than 50,000. That includes us looking at this room. 35% will, uh, I would say 70% will need long-term care. So, again, millions will be not able to meet the basic requirements as they get older, which is a shame, really. Uh, so, Again, this is a tool that perhaps would be helpful. It's not for everyone, but it, it could be a consideration. This is what we look at those things. So can they buy? <clears throat> can they plan themselves in a congruent plan? They can talk to Mark Wu and says, can I get a life insurance or a writer, long-term care, and fund it with a reverse mortgage in case that I avoid some of these issues that I'm sure most of you have already heard of people that are going like that. 
So, but they can purchase, they can refi. It's very flexible, by the way. And so, yes. Thank you, Mario. <coughs> Christopher, what are the new loan limits in 2020? Okay. So we did have an increase this year, which is great. Last year, our conforming loan limit was four hundred eighty-four thousand. Um, it's gone to five hundred ten thousand four hundred. Well, let me preface that by saying it's going to vary from county to county. We're in a high cost area in LA County, but very different if you go to Riverside, San Bernardino, which don't have high cost loan limits. So I just start with that. But again. A uh, single unit purchase is now 510400 for what they call a conforming loan. But they do have high balance as well. That goes up to as high as 765600 So that's still considered a conforming loan, just a high balance conforming. So it's not yet a jumbo loan. A uh, two unit is 653550 for the conforming amount and 980625 for the high balance limit. A three unit, 789,950 for conforming, and for high balance, 1,184,925. And a four unit conforming, you could purchase with a loan up to 981,700, and the high balance would go almost to 1.5. It's 1 1,472,550. But you have to be careful when you're looking at these other counties, especially our neighboring counties like San Bernardino, Riverside, they don't have a high cost loan limit. So, and their, their uh, conforming loans, conventional, are gonna be the same as our 510 up to that 981 figure. But FHA is a little bit different. For the high cost areas here, our FHA limits are the same as our conventional conforming limits. But like, for example, San Bernardino, FHA loan, the max is 442,750. They don't have this high balance category. So you're not going to be able to buy with an FHA loan a $600,000 house and put 3.5% down in San Bernardino where you know, you can, you're getting closer to it here with, with our higher limits. So just be careful when you're looking in those other counties. You may not be able to go as high with low down payment financing. Um, but again, that FHA limit in San Bernardino goes from 442 on a single family up to as much as 851, 450 on a four unit. But they are higher than they were and higher than most of the rest of the country for sure. Um, but yeah, we live in a high cost area, so as you're all aware. Thank you, Chris, Mario, Margaret, and Richard for answering our, these tough questions. Um, if time permits, I'm gonna open up the floor to ask. Uh, if anyone have any pressing questions you wanna ask our panelists, they can ask, answer. Uh, Mario, what are the interest rates on the reverse mortgage compared to the conventional <coughs> loan? Well, that's a great question. Uh, reverse mortgage really has a, uh, a couple of options there. There is a fixed rate and a variable rate. The variable rate is usually what they use. Uh, it usually comes in around a, a little bit higher than the regular late, uh, rates, maybe about a quarter to a half a point higher, and they also have a margin. Uh, at that point, the reality is who cares if you don't have a mortgage payment? Uh, because at the end of the day, it's your money and it, you're just you're saying, I don't care, my rate is 10% if I don't have a mortgage payment and I put this $3,000 that I'll be paying in, uh, and put it into a fund that will, that will uh, uh, earn that much or whatever for you on purpose. So it becomes, it is important, but it's a lot of times I find it to be not that relevant because of the purpose of it. But it is fairly low, and okay. as long as the rates are low, they are so really more important rate. for the errors, the, uh, the upcost, the points, the cost, the cost, the fees. Oh yeah, because Those they're worrying are, about their inheritance. Exactly. <laughs> they're saying that when you die, why are you gonna leave me? You know what some people have done when they get a reverse mortgage? They have three hundred thousand. Son, here's your two hundred thousand. Here's your inheritance. Have a good life. And you know what will happen? I heard. They will spend it in less than two years. But what are the fees? <laughs> Mario, but what are the fees? They don't want to give it to the loan officer. Either. Oh, no, no, no. The fees, a lot of times, they're zero. Uh, they're, oh. oh, yeah. Wait a minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The loan origination. Wait, wait, wait. That's a great question. They're expensive. Yeah. Uh, I will have to say they're expensive. <laughs> Typically, they're running at about 17000 And they're because they're FHA driven. 
most of the fees are coming because of the FHA insurance, mm -hmm. not because of the loan origination and all of that. If you if you look at the loan originations and all of that, it's pretty much the same as the other loans. But when you put in the MIP, that's the, the bulk of the expense. But it's all funded within the reverse mortgage, so it's basically out of pocket, really. Maggie wants to know if the heirs can refinance it. Well, yes. Uh, well, yes. Uh, well, the person's still alive. Yes. 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 Okay. Or, uh, by the way, that's a good question. When is it due? When they die, when they sell, there is no prepayment penalties, and they can, they want to refinance or pay it off. Can they pay it if they want to? Yes. yes. So it's a lot of flexibility on, on that one. Well, these are our affiliate <laughs> panelists. So they're here to answer any questions that you have. You feel, please, you know, make this a resource. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a slightly longer walk for me today uh, with all our panelists up there. Um, this president's message is going to be a little bit different, and you might think I've lost my mind for a second, but bear with me. We sleep at Karen Timorous Beastie, oh what a panic in thy Beastie, down even a start away to hasty with big hair battle. I would be lathe to run and chase thee with murder and battle. What language am I speaking? English, thank you. It's, um, it's some of you claim you don't understand me at the best of times anyway, so I thought I'd, I'd break that down. It's English, but it's in a Scots dialect. It's in an 18th century Scots dialect, so it's not even a modern one. Uh, it's not Gaelic, that's a separate language entirely, actually. Um, and even less comprehensible. Um, now, the reason I'm, I'm breaking out, Scots, is, is um, because we're, we're coming up to a celebration, and I'm aware that we're, we're running into Lunar New Year, which is important to, to an awful lot of our members. Um, and I'm also very aware that here at Western Gabriel, we have an incredible cultural diversity. We have people whose backgrounds are from Asia, from Central and South America, um, the, the occasional European, Vince and myself, and uh, Giuseppe, second generation there. Some of us have even been in this country for generations as well. Um, but as we come into Lunar New Year, I want to point out we're also coming up to Burns Night, which is a big deal to the Scottish population, which, again, at Western Gable, I realize is a population of one. <laughs> we have two. Excellent. That's a 100% increase. <laughs> So for those of you who are not familiar with Robert Burns, he was a poet. He was a poet and a farmer in the southwest of Scotland. He's widely regarded as, as Scotland's bard, so Scotland's national poet. Uh, he was born in Alloway in Ayrshire in 1759 and died in 1796 in Dumfries. So again, that kind of southwest corner of Scotland, he died relatively young. Um, he also had, he, he got around a bit, he had 12 children that we know of. Not all disabled. Uh, and it will shock you to know he, he was known for being a romantic poet. He, he was one of the early poets in, in the romance um, movement. He is responsible for a lot of Scottish literature that came after. He's a big influence as well. We celebrate him because fun, fundamentally he is a big part of our culture. We celebrate him in January because his birthday was January the 25th. Apparently the first Burns Night was held on January 29th, 1802, because they got the date wrong. It didn't matter, they still had a party, it's fine. Um, a a Burns Supper, it, it's, um, they're celebrated around the world, obviously in Scotland primarily. Uh, we actually have a national day, St Andrew's Day, but more people take notice of this one, because there is more drinking. <laughs> um, the format has changed very little since that first uh, that first Burns Supper. It starts with a general welcome and announcements, followed by the Selkirk Grace, which was written by Burns. After the Grace comes the piping and cutting of the haggis. The, some of you may be aware of what's in a haggis. Uh, some of you may not want to know. Um, so I, you ask me after if you really want the details. Um, so the address of the haggis is written and the haggis is cut open. Uh, the event usually after the meal, there's usually a series of toasts, including a toast to the lassies and a reply from the lassies. It's usually tongue-in-cheek. It's usually very funny. 
it's certainly funnier after a couple of drinks. Um, and there is a toast to the immortal memory and an overview of Burns' life and work is given. This is done in January. It is a cold, dark country in Scotland. It's also an opportunity for us to gather together with friends and family, have a bit of fun, drink an awful lot of whiskey, uh, and get involved in a bit of Scottish country dancing, which if you're in rural areas is actually a full contact sport. Um, so, so all that to say, when you're celebrating the Lunar New Year, there is another celebration coming up as well. Uh, that's important to, I now learned to us. Uh, so when you're having your Lunar New Year dumplings, celebrating with your family, I encourage you to grab a glass of whiskey and, and raise a little glass to Robert Burns as well. Thank you.